<laughs> well, yeah, it's good to be here. <laughs> Swedish, yeah. I'm Norse, Norwegian, yeah, sure. Uh, reminds me of a story. <laughs> Only in Lena Davis married for a long time, yeah, sure. All of a sudden, Oli died. And Lena calls the newspaper and says, What do I do? How do I let people know that Oli died? Well, ma'am, you get five free words, and after that, we have to charge you 10 cents a word. Okay, then to put this in, Oli died. But, ma'am, that's only two words. You get five free words. Oh, okay. Yeah, but, but put this in Oli died. Boat for sale. <laughs> oh well. So much for Oli's legacy. <laughs> Chuck was talking about the uh, dad's coaching clinic, and I have a pastor friend here that was one of the very first ones that I was able to train down in Florida, and he has taken this dad's coaching clinic in the last year and three months, and he's ran with it. I'd like Pastor Philip Holzma to come on up and just give us a quick window of what you've been doing. Give him a hand. This is Pastor Phil. Pardon? Team Florida, dude. Together, evangelizing all men in Florida. No, after the election, I was kind of repronouncing Florida. <laughs> Flora, duh. <laughs> hey, hey, I'm from Misery, and uh, we're going to run Harry Truman for Senate next time. <laughs> Think about it, okay? Okay. <laughs> I, don't, I don't mean to be this weird, but uh, would you... Go ahead. And, yeah, I know. Would you tell the guys what you've been doing with Dad's Coaching Clinic, what God's just done in your life, men's life, and uh, in the community? Well, it is just really exciting, uh, especially to see and sense the heart of us men to be better dads. And I am operating on the premise that our world is filled with men that want to be better dads that just don't know how. And through Dad's Coaching Clinic, God has given us a tremendous tool to put in the hands of men who want to be better dads but don't even know how to ask. And uh, next month, I'm, I'm going to be going to jail. Um, <clears throat> my congregation asked if uh, they were going to let me back out. Uh, I don't know what that meant. But God has opened a door for me to go into our jail and teach men that are getting ready to be released from jail, the Dad's Coaching Clinic. I, uh, I'm going to be working with other pastors because it's not about me. It is about lifting up the name of Jesus because he said, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto him. Unto him. And so we're going to be working together with them. Uh, I'm also going to be working with Youth for Christ and also the family court in our county. Uh, I'm having to go at this slow because doors are opening so fast and I, I found I'm just one person. And so uh, until we get more pastors uh, certified as instructors, uh, but the family uh, courts are another door of opportunity, the juvenile justice system here in the state of Florida because one of the things we found out in the state of Florida is if you just fix the kids and put them right back into the same situation, they're just going to end up back in the system again. And so this is a great opportunity. And I just want to encourage you. I hope uh, this will challenge you to open up your thinking about what can be done with the Dad's Coaching Clinic. And I, I just challenge you, especially pastors that are here, to get on board with this. This is so awesome. And this is a great way to reach your community. Thanks. Thanks, Pastor. The reason why we launched the Dad's Coaching Clinic, we wanted to make it so inexpensive to go to this clinic because many fathering clinics cost $25, $40 to go through. And you know what? 
Dad's Coaching Clinic, the books cost four bucks. And so uh, we want anybody to go through it. In fact, churches can scholarship men at that price, pretty cheap, right? And so that's what we want to see happen. Men, many of us have been given a great heritage. I, I'm a fourth generation Pentecostal and I'm passing on a heritage, but I've been given a rich heritage, but the, the heritage I've been given is not as important as the legacy I leave. And a lot of us, we search for success in life, and we're succeeding, we're seem, seemingly very, very busy doing all kinds of things. And one of the things that we discovered in the Dad's Coaching Clinic was this little quote, we should never be afraid of failure we should be afraid of succeeding at things that won't make a difference. And men, our lives, we need to make a difference. Our speaker this afternoon is making an impact, a difference in his world. Jesus has made a significant difference in his life. Our speaker today was over 20 years in the military. He's one of those tough guys. He's an airborne ranger, right? Right? He's a colonel in the military. He spent five years in Italy as, uh, as basically a diplomat, an ambassador for the military among the Italian army. And he's got great, great stories. After he retired, he went to work for Promise Keepers and God placed it upon his heart to begin a ministry of passing on a legacy or a blessing to our young people. I grew up without a dad. Chuck did, Ron Roberts did, Chuck's predecessor. My dad left when I was five years old and I saw him again when he was in his casket. I didn't see him for those three years. And uh, he died on his 45th birthday 36 years ago this month. And I tell you what, it's when, uh, when uh, Richard was talking about uh, his dad and his relationships. And then last night when we were singing, you know, daddy, I, I never said those words after five years old uh, for a long time. And I tell you what, this man is passing on a legacy and a blessing. And I want you to give it up for a great, great man of God, Chuck Stecker. It's a remarkable blessing to be here for me personally. I think if, I'm deeply grateful to Chuck, to the staff, and to the people here for allowing me to be a part of this and to having a few minutes to share with you about a burden that God has placed on my heart. You know, in recent years, our hearts have been broken and our faith has been tested in places like Paducah, Kentucky, Oregon, a little church in Fort Worth, Texas, Columbine High School, 10 minutes from our own ministry offices and our own home. The senseless and tragic loss of life of our next generation of leaders has literally brought us to our knees and for some questioned our own faith about a God that would allow that to happen. But I need to tell you that there's a greater loss that's taking place across our country, but it lacks the sensationalism and the army of reporters following every story and searching out every little sub-story and peeking into the windows of the victims, hoping to see something to report or to share that no one else has captured. The tragic loss that's taking place across our nation is the loss of our young men and women from the churches of Jesus Christ. And no one is reporting on that because no one seems to understand that or have a grasp of that. But we are losing our young men and women of this next generation at a hemorrhaging rate. If it was a medical term, it would be life-threatening right now for the church of Jesus Christ that we don't have the legacy that's coming behind us of young men and women that will take over the army that is being raised up right now. 
I spent 23 years serving this nation in the United States Army. I came to this area of the country, th flew in three or four times before I got to land here. The first couple, three times, I jumped out of an airplane. Now, people say, why in the world would you do that? If you knew the pilots I knew, you'd want to be able to jump out of those. So since I got Air Force guys here, any Air Force guys? Okay. You know, there's one of the things I need to tell you up front, and that is I, I really am a sensitive guy. If I offend anybody, get over it. You're not here to whine and whimper like a rat eating an onion. Either stand up, take it, or now's a good time to go look at resources. Okay? Anybody need to leave? Go ahead. I'm not offended. All right? Because we need to understand what's taking place in our nation, and we need to be prepared to do something about it. Really, raising up an army is what you came for, but if you don't look at raising up a legacy, it'll be a one-generation army that will go away. You know, I want you to think with me about some scripture. And you, you know Joshua's statement in 24, he talks about in his farewell, when he says, you know, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know, a lot of times Satan would have us believe that that was one of those quiet statements that was just kind of let out there as if, well, golly, if I, I really don't have a choice. It was kind of like he was standing up with some elders and they were watching this thing going, Oh, man, do you see what's going on? Yeah, I see them. Boy, they're getting crazy. You know, and they kind of said, well, you know, what are you going to do? Well, I, gee, I don't know. You think it'll get that bad? We'll have to make a decision? You know, yet that's what Satan would have you believe, that it doesn't require the statement that was actually made. But you see, that wasn't the case. Joshua stood before the entire Israel, Israelites and said, as for me and my house, but he preceded that. He says, look. If you're just a street punk and serving the God that lives is too much for you, and you would rather serve the gods across the river when you were held in captivity, or the Amorites in whose land you dwell now, go ahead and do that. But then what he said was, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Who powerful statement, isn't it? Can't you just see three generations later, you know? Uh, it's, 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 it, I can picture it his great-great-grandchildren running around in their little hand-sewn tunics that really wasn't there when their great-great-grandfather had stood before them. And, you know, they'd jump up on this little mound of dirt with their little wooden stick like it was a sword and go, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, you know, mimicking what their great-great-grandfather had done. Can't, can't you picture that? I, I'll do a Judge Ito sidebar, you know. My, my daughter and my son-in-law were moving from house to house and they had one movie and they would put it in. My little granddaughter was less than two years old and it was Prince of Egypt. She would watch it as they were packing up boxes then they'd go to the new house and unpack them and put that in so that's what she saw. And my daughter said on this one day she heard her little daughter, my granddaughter, less than two years old and she's walking through the house going, let my people go, let my people go. And I said, you go girl, you go. <laughs> but can't you just see it with Joshua's great, great grandchildren doing the same thing? Well, when you turn from Joshua, the 24th book, and you go then to the very next chapter, book of the Bible and Judges, and the second chapter there, it's very clear. It says, after that generation, it says, Joshua, the son of Nun, died and went with his, four, went to with his forefathers, was buried in the land of Timnath Ares in the hill country of Ephraim, because he was of the tribe of Ephraim. And it says, and after that, another generation grew up who neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Now, wait a minute. Joshua raised an army. But the legacy of Joshua was the next generation neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. This isn't a slam on Joshua, and I don't make it up. I just read it to you. I ain't that bright to make it up. I just read it to you. It says, after that generation, there grew another generation who neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. We are so focused on a revival in our time. Are we also focused on what will be the legacy that will come from our generation passed on to the next? It wasn't just in Joshua. Read about Gideon. When you go again to the book of Judges in the 7th chapter and the 8th chapter, the moment that Gideon died, again, the people turned to false gods. 
and turn their back on the living God. Now the question is, with this army that we are being called to be a part of, that honor bound is stepping forward in the assemblies of God to raise an army, the question is though, will it end there or will we also raise a legacy to follow on behind that? You see now what we're into? The recruiting business. How good and how effective is an army unless alongside of that you have a process to recruit the future army? Now guys, let me tell you something. We get confused about this term legacy. Everybody's using that. We just finished an election year, and I, I think making fun of Florida. Come on, Jeff. Florida. <laughs> Any state that would be picked to host the Super Bowl has got to be pretty good, don't you think? So, I mean, Super Bowl in Florida next week? It'll be March before we know the results. But... <laughs> <laughs> you know, now, can't, you, can't you just see the officials after the game with the dimpled scorecard? Okay, did they score in the first quarter or did they intend to score in the first quarter? Well, based on the fact they scored in the other two quarters, it would be consistent that even though they didn't score in the first quarter, they intended to score in the first quarter, you know? That's a tough one to work with, isn't it? <laughs> you see? But we've come through this election year, and starting almost a year ago, the big question was, what would be the legacy of President Clinton? We don't have time to talk about all of that. Because, you see, we really didn't understand what legacy meant. We're confused in our country. We're confused as men in our country. Let me clear that up for you. You leave a legend by what you do. You leave a legacy by who you are. You leave a legend by what you do. But you leave a legacy by who you are. The fiber and the fabric of the being that you pass on to the next generation will create the legacy regardless of what you do per se. You see, we often think that I will do this, I will do this, and I will do this, and that will be my legacy. I was in St. Louis, Missouri, and it happened to be the very first game a couple of seasons ago when Mark McGuire broke the record and everything, but a guy asked me, he said, what do you think the legacy of Mark McGuire will be? And I said, I think what you're asking is, what will be the legend of Mark McGuire? I don't know Mark McGuire. I have no idea in terms of the fiber, the fabric, the substance. I read a lot of good things in terms of foundations for kids and that. But I said, you know what I think your real question is, is what will be his ultimate records? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many home runs do you think he'll hit? And I said, that's not his legacy. That will be Mark McGuire's legend, which will stand until somebody else surpasses it, because that's what a legend is all about. Now, the legacy of Mark McGuire will have a lot more to do with his impact on the game, the person of quality or lack of quality, and I'm not making a judgment on that. I'm just stating a fact for you. The legacy for you and your home will not be what you do per se, it will be who you are and how that is transmitted to the next generation, not just in your home, but in your churches and in your communities. See, that will be the legacy. And when they look at the army that was raised in this new century, at the latter part of the century we've just come out of in the new one, the legacy will be what is passed on and lived out by our children and children's children. And while they turn the back, their backs on the church of Jesus Christ, as did the generations that followed Joshua and the generations that followed Gideon and others that we have read about. Or will be the generation following us. You will see on a rise in terms of their faith, their relationship with Jesus Christ and their impact on a hurting nation. What will be our legacy? Well, let's take a look at where our legacy is headed right now, first of all. Guys, I know and you know, having come out of this election year, we can take statistics and do just about whatever we want to do with them, can't we? But here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to share some numbers with you and some statistics. I'm not going to ask you to believe them or accept them. I'm going to ask you to pray about them and see if they resonate in your heart. And God says that's valid for you. That's all that matters. And if they're not, don't use them and don't pay any attention to them. Fair enough. Statistically, here's what we think we are seeing very clearly. 
of the generation that is starting in grade school this past September and the September before that, at the same time they are in church with their family. So kindergarten and church starting at the same time, statistics tell us that we will lose 70% of those young men and women by the time we get to their high school graduation. 70% of the church, those young people, will be lost by the time we get to the high school graduation. But it doesn't stop there. What that leaves you then is, is 30% of what God entrusted to us as stewards, correct? It's not about evangelism. This is about just being a good steward with what God's given us. So now we're down to 30% of what God gave us and entrusted to our care, right? But it doesn't stop there. Denomination after denomination is reporting that of the young people that graduate from high school while in church, the average is between 85 and 95 percent of those will be lost from the church by the time we get to college graduation. Now guys, I know, and you know, college graduation means something different to all of us. I mean, the happiest six years of my life was my freshman year in college. But they're using kind of like a five-year period for college, you know, somehow they associate that with normal. I'm not sure where they get that, but, but in that next five-year period from high school to college graduation, the Assemblies of God reported last year out of, out of Dallas that we lose 90% of our young people from the high school graduation to the college graduation. Now, what does that leave you when you extrapolate that out? Very simply, if you take a 70% loss of a 100% figure, leaving you 30% at high school graduation, and you take 90% of that that goes away, you're down to 3 to 4% of what you started with. Guys, that's not, a, that's not an evangelism issue. That's not reaching the lost. You see, our recruitment for the next generation, our legacy for this army is failing because we're not even keeping what God gave us to begin with. Let alone the families of the unsaved. I'm talking about our sons and our daughters. There are men sitting in here today that have poured their lives out in church. There are pastors sitting in here today who have raised their own children in the church. And at age 18, you've watched your own children walk out of the church and only come back for special occasions or if you ask them to come back and be with you for something. This room right here has families like that in it. It's a tragic feeling, isn't it? To think of raising your child in the church with you, thinking you're doing all of those things that, that Pastor Crisco talked about and others will talk to you about, only to see your son or daughter walk out of the church at age 18 and your heart is breaking to see that it's not being passed on to your children and your grandchildren and you don't know why. I want to tell you why that's happening. And then I want to give you some help of how the Church of Jesus Christ can come together and change the trend what's taking place and retake a generation for Jesus Christ. Because I believe that's what we're here for from my perspective. You see, the church has done a pretty good job of raising kids, but it's done a terrible job of raising adults. For the pastors that are in here, I don't mean to offend you, but if that happens, I'll give you the same offer we talked about earlier. You can get over it and help your men get over it. Because that's the truth. We've raised good kids, but we haven't brought them into godly adulthood and transition and bridge them into godly adulthood in a viable, meaningful way within the body of Christ. We've kind of left that up to them because it was confusing for us as well. Let me ask you a couple of questions. How many of you remember the day you got your driver's license? Tell me that. Man, I do. I'm 53 years old. You're supposed to go, whoa, he doesn't look that old. Come on. Come on. You can do it. You can do it. Come on. 
All right, work it. All right. When I feel good, I finish earlier. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Anything before six o'clock is a break now, isn't it? All right. You remember the day you got your driver's license? I do. I mean, it was obviously a couple of days ago in Omaha, Nebraska. I can picture the testing facility. I can tell you on the 5th of December that day in a 55 Ford Greed two-door, if I could remember, driving out to 78th and Dodge, getting it. You know what's fun? It's coming home that night. Do you remember the first time you got to drive your car all by yourself legally? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. There was a brother in here from Fayetteville, Tennessee. He knows what I'm talking about. He was driving from the time he was nine, I would imagine. Okay? But, you know, it's different when you got the piece of paper. It's legal, and if you get stopped, everyone knows you have a right to drive. You are a licensed driver. You remember the day you got your driver's license? Remember the day you graduated from high school? Well, let me rephrase that. Do you remember the day you tell people you graduated from high school? Okay, now we're working it. I think a lot of those people were counting ballots down here. I, I promised we'd get away from that. <laughs> but you know what I remember about that? I was the oldest of five, and graduating from high school, I can remember that after the ceremony, I remember kind of where I sat. I don't remember the speaker or anything. Who does? But I, I remember going back down into the, the basement of the Civic Auditorium in Omaha, Nebraska, and two guys that had graduated the year before came in, and they grabbed me and another guy, a friend of ours, and a couple of teachers, and they had a brown paper bag. And it wasn't carrying an autograph book to collect signatures after graduation. You know what I'm getting at. And we went over behind one of the curtains, you know, because we were turning in our... We were turning in our robes, and we got to keep the funny little hats with those stringy things. What do you do with those after graduation, by the way? I, I don't know either, okay? But another story. But, but we had a drink together. You know why that was significant? Didn't matter how much to drink or didn't matter what it was to drink. It was something that marked that I had gone from something I could not have done an hour earlier and two teachers having a drink with me. It marked a passage in my life, didn't it? I can remember that. I don't want any hands on this one, but the little hands on your heart will show. But how many of you remember the first time you had sex? Can we say sex in a Yeah, we can, okay. How many of you remember the first time you had sex? We use the term making love, but quite frankly, for many of us, unless it was in a covenant relationship that God Almighty himself had ordained and blessed through a marriage covenant relationship, for many men in here, like myself, it wasn't in that. It was an act of sin and violation of a young lady. It was also an act of seeking my manhood, because that's what I thought men did, right? How many of you remember the day that you got married? Now, guys, the fact that you were physically present, as shown by photos and videos, doesn't mean you remember it. <laughs> a lot of you are operating on hearsay information, or at least a third-party quote on that, okay? You know, you, you know, face those days where your wife takes down the marriage license that you did, in fact, sign says, see, see? Don't give me that nonsense. You're locked into this thing, you know? And they kind of... So you remember the day you had sex, you remember marriage, you remember high school, you remember graduation, you remember a driver's license. How many of you remember with that same crystal clarity the day your father took you in his arms and embraced you and publicly proclaimed before your church and your community that you were a man and prayed that blessing over you as a man? Probably an average of about three or four out of a hundred can remember that day because that's about the only ones that had it happen to them. You see, we're operating in a confused society because we're all seeking to prove our own manhood and we're forcing that upon our children because we haven't operated under God's plan. We're confused because as fathers now and grandfathers, we think now we're in charge of giving manhood because we thought our father was in charge of giving us our manhood. We think that we get to be the ones to decide. You know, when you're down south here, you know the old saying, when does a boy become a man? When his daddy says so. You know it, don't you? 
I love it when they say that because they're reciting scripture. They just don't know it. And it's a great way to lead them right into God's words. And man, you are good. How long have you been studying the Bible? That is wonderful. And they are normally clueless and they'll look at you like a calf looking at a new gate. Now, some of you have not been on a farm and you have no idea what I just said. And you can ask your buddy to help you understand that when we're done. But you know that look, right? Because here's the scripture, Galatians 4.1. It says that as long as the heir remains a child, he is no different than the slave, though he owns the entire estate. Now, 4.2 goes on to say, and he remains a child until a time appointed by his father. You say, why do our children rebel then when they get to a certain age? Could I suggest to you that God has brought them into their adulthood and they're waiting for you to confirm that in the absence of doing that? They rebel against the childhood tactics of their parents, the churches, and they leave that to go find a place where they can be accepted as an adult because it's not in the church these days. That's what's happening. Let me tell you what's happening to our young people, and I'll tell you the times in which they're leaving. I can tell you what's taking place. Look, I'm not this smart. God gives me a lot of stuff that even amazes my wife. That's okay. And I don't say that jokingly. She goes, my wife was raised as a Christian woman, starting about two years before she was born, I think. And except for a brief period of time where she drifted away, but that was so God could use her to reel me in and then brought us both back in. And she gets upset. She says, I've been reading the Bible all my life, and I'll read something, and God just reveals something to me like that. And she says, it's just not fair. I said, look, i got a lot less time to work with than you do. You've been doing this a long time. He's got to really concentrate some things in my life. But when I look at that and I understand, why do you think they rebel? And here's what happens. At about age 13, something happens. How many of you have daughters? Can I ask that question? Let's just stop and pray for them now, okay? It's a tough world out there, ain't it? All right, let's talk about our daughters for a second to get a perspective on this thing. When a young lady turns about 13, something happens to her, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. She gets bumps. It's being taped. We've got to watch what we say here. She gets curves, some bumps, okay, in the right places. And guys start looking at her differently. Now, as dads, we want to hurt those guys, don't we? God speaks of righteous anger. Look, I got a daughter. I understand. Now, let me tell you something. I've searched the scriptures. We want to hurt those little critters, and we want to hurt those guys bad for looking at our daughter that way. And the scriptures are very clear. Thou shalt not kill, but it doesn't say a thing about wounding and maiming those guys. And I think if you wound and maim them, they'll be stronger for it, and that'll help out the rest of our community. You know, and you're thinking that way, don't you? So you just want to bring that little guy in, get your arm around him, and beat him. Now, there's a couple of things, and the reason you want to do that is, one, you know God will bless that, don't you? Because not only will it have a profound impact on him, but all the other guys that may take a look at your daughter, but you're also helping out all the other guys that have daughters too, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. But in any event, uh, one of the real reasons you want to hurt this guy is because you're a mind reader. You know what he's thinking about your daughter and what he wants to do with her, don't you? And you know why you do? You thought about other men's daughters the same way about his age, didn't you? Yeah. You know exactly what's on his mind. You think you know what he's going home and reading in magazines, too, to get ready to come and take your daughter out for a date and all that stuff, too, don't you? But then you realize that this change, this transformational change has taken place with your daughter. But you're in charge of her womanhood, aren't you? You get to decide when she becomes a woman. So I want you to envision this conversation that you may have already thought you had with your daughter and she's responded in a positive way. It kind of goes like, you know, Sarah, we'll use a godly name, little gal, 13 years old, and, and daddy puts his arms around her and daddy happens to be a, a leading lay leader of the church, you know, so he's a godly man. When you say godly, you've got to use a deeper voice. It's not just something you can say with other words. A godly man. And he goes, uh, Sarah, honey, you know daddy loves you. Oh, daddy loves you. Yes, he does. And you know, Sarah, um, this thing that's, thing that's happening to your um, body, 
It's always an easy word from a father to a daughter's body. Well, you know, daddy knows it's of God, you know it's of God, and it's kind of like the caterpillar becoming the butterfly, and it's a wonderful thing, and oh, I've looked forward to this. Um, but then you go, you know, Sarah, honey, daddy's just not ready for this yet, so I'm going to have you wait two more years to develop. And she looks at you and says, where's my daddy and what have you done with him and who are you? Right? But doesn't the same thing happen if you just ignore what's taking place there? Now, I tell you that because you have zero control over when God chooses to change that young girl into a woman. You have zero control over that. But you think by ignoring it till the time that you can emotionally handle it, you're in control. All you've done is no different than the slave as long as they remain a child. And what do you think they're rebelling against? Slavery. Think about it. That's cute for girls, isn't it? Fortunately, us guys, we're, we're not. We don't fall prey to that kind of nonsense, do we? I have two sons as well. I, I can tell you that the son, you know, he... <laughs> At one point in his life, is walking through the house buck naked. You know what I'm talking about. Walks right in front of his mother, in front of the TV, just finished his bath. He walks to the refrigerator. He gets a gallon of milk and two packages of double-stuffed Oreos. Yeah. Walks by again, buck naked. Hi, Mom. Goes into the other room, right? Doesn't think a thing of it. And then, zap! Something happens to him. And the day after one of those experiences, he's in the bathtub. Unbeknownst to his mother and even you, God has begun to transform this young man physically and the mind, and he's now in the tub a day later. And his mother, your wife, opens up the bathroom door just a little bit. She's putting fresh towels on the, on the sink there, right? And the young man now who is not the same young man he was the day before when he walked naked in front of her to get the two packages of double stuffs and the gallon of milk goes, Mom, I'm naked. Have you lost your mind? Are you a pervert? What in the world is going through your mind that you'd walk in on me like this? If the guys know you've done that, I'm dead meat. And she's going, now wait a minute. Wasn't it less than 24 hours earlier? It was, hi, Mom, gallon of milk to the... And he has no recollection of those days. They don't even ring a bell. You can talk to him about them, but he, that was when he was a kid. Something's happened in his life, as it has in the young ladies. And what has happened in those lives is very simple. God has transformed them from children to young men and women. Now, what do they need from us? Since we're not in control of their adulthood, could I suggest that our legacy for this raisin army, for our families and our churches, is now dependent upon whether we have the wisdom and the understanding to take them at the point that God has brought them and define, affirm, recognize, and confirm godly adulthood for them because they're scared to death and they want to know what to do with this new person they found in their body. But you see, we're not doing that. We're continuing to treat them like children. We have a memorizing scriptures that nothing changes in the church for them. And that's why at age 14 and 15, our young people are fleeing the church, fleeing the church. And at 16, the numbers drop off the cliff. And why at 16? Because in most states, they can drive legally. And now as young adults, they don't have to go to church because now they have a whole option of other choices that are available for them. And they take those options. So our young people that were raised on the scriptures and in the Bible studies and the, the competitive verse competitions and so forth are leaving our churches and many of them are your sons and daughters and the sons and daughters of your friends. Because why? They've arrived at a different season in their life and we have not recognized it. So on they go, and then they get to the end of high school, and what takes place? They graduate, and in the absence of that affirmation and confirmation of what God has done, they just assume they're young adults now, 
and they step out into the world as adults. And a lot of things happen, many in their colleges and things like that, where they're discipled out of the church, the local church. And what I'm saying by that is, is you've got a lot of groups that meet them on campus and do Bible studies, discipleship groups, and they do wonderful things. But what ultimately happens is they graduate from college, and here's their two experiences. They have had a church experience that's equated to their childhood. They've had an adult experience that is without church. And so when they say, where do they go from there? What happens is they go right from there to try to seek an adult experience with the Lord that doesn't require church. In October of last year in Atlanta, Georgia, with the National Coalition of Men's Ministry, Josh McDowell spoke, and he began by saying, we have lost the war. We've lost it. These young men and women in our churches today will not be the leaders of the future of our churches. That was his opening comment. It's on tapes. You can get it from the NCMM. I disagree with him. I have great respect for him and the work that God is doing and continuing to do through him, but I don't think we've lost the war. Man, I'll tell you what, I think we're in dangerous times. I think we've lost a lot of battles, but we haven't lost the war. And if you feel that way, why even bother show up here? You can't feel we've lost the war and think it's still okay to raise an army. The only reason we're mobilizing now is because the war is not lost. And we've got to fight it, men. And we've got to fight it with the tools that God has given us. But we, uh, we need to understand what those are. Simultaneous with us raising up in honor bound an army, could I suggest to you that the future of that army, the vitality of that army, the potential for longevity of that army to continue fighting that's going to go beyond the next generation after Joshua and Gideon will also be our ability to work simultaneously to recruit the next army. And that is to bring our young men and women into godly adulthood. And when we do that, we will be taking the step to bring them into the body of Christ and weave them fiber and fabric in there and not lose them. There is no reason our young people have to leave the church to come back and be found again. We have that experience because a lot in our generation graduated, left the church, and we came back. May I suggest to you this generation is not doing that. In fact, a reference on that is a book called The Bridger Generation by Tom Rainier. And one of the things he says in there is, he says, literally, he says, if you look at four generations and you look at the builder generation, the 30s and the early 40s, 65% of that generation knew the Lord. I have suggested for a long time if we fall between fall lower than 50%, we will lose a generation. Okay? The baby boomers, the next generation after that, the estimates are 35% knew the Lord. But the interesting thing is, is in the baby boomers, they still knew. You could give them John 3.16 behind the goalpost. They knew it was a Bible scripture. And give them a Bible, they could basically find it because of praying grandparents and their own parents going to church. But then we give way to the baby busters. And of that generation, we find our first post-Christian generation our country has ever known. 15% of the baby busters know the Lord. 15%. Now, the interesting thing is, is when they see John 3.16 behind the goalpost, it could easily be a pizza commercial or an ad for something. They're just not sure because they haven't had the exposure at all through their own families of the Scripture and of the Lord's teaching. And then we get to the new generation. You, sons and daughters, some of our grandchildren, the youth of today, the Bridger generation. And the best estimates are in his book, 4% will know the Lord. Now let me take you back, rewind. Zip. When we took the 70% that we lose from kindergarten to high school, and then we took the 90% loss of the remaining factor from high school to the end of college, what did we say? Three to 4% would be what was left, right? And from totally different studies, he looks at it and says, in this generation, 4% will know the Lord. Now, that's assuming we don't change anything. Pastor Joseph, last night, remember what he said? Definition of insanity, doing the same thing the same way over and over again, each time expecting a different result. Well, we can go that way, and we've got 4% of this generation in the church, or we can decide to change what we're doing in order to get a different result. I want to suggest a couple of things to you. I want to suggest that 
We don't have the total amount of time to walk you through everything. In a, in a booth that we have over there, we have an introductory pack on some rites of passage, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that. In the magazine that you were given, great magazine that Honorbound has put together for us, it's absolutely terrific. There are some wonderful articles, but there's also an article on reaching the next generation, the case for rites of passage. Here's what I want to suggest to you. I want to suggest that the rites of passage need to be conducted. Now that term, rite of passage, let's just understand. What that is, is those owning the territory give the right to others to enter there where they're secure, safe, and can function as a member of the group. You know, we can use a passport as an example. It was originally a writ of passage, meant you could pass. When uh, M.I. went to rebuild the wall, you remember the king gave him a letter. It was his writ of passage, safe passage, and it authorized him to do things. Well, when we do a rite of passage, what we're talking about is those of us that are in that group are accepting on equal par that next group that's coming in. That what we need to do is, as a church, understand what it means to embrace the next generation and confirm in them what we've already acknowledged God has done that we thought we were in control of. And confirm in them the adulthood that God has placed in them. I'll give you just briefly a couple of things that we do in this process. And if you allow this to happen outside the church, can I suggest to you that what you do is you allow their adulthood then to be identified with something outside the church. We're absolutely committed, absolutely committed and believing that the rite of passage to be effective for what God designed it to be needs to be in the body of Christ and in the church. Believe me on that. That that needs to be identified because when they identify their adulthood, that needs to be identified with their local church, their pastor, with their family right there. And basically what we suggest to you is having a structured format that is done each year that allows the next generation, starting at age 13, because if you look at when these young people come into adulthood physically, we're not saying maturity. Don't confuse maturity with adulthood. A lot of us wouldn't be here if the requirement to be here was maturity as opposed to just being an adult male. Right? You know which ones we're talking about, and if not, we can call some wives and get some confirmation for you. We don't need to go there, do we? Okay? But you understand what I'm saying. That there has to be a structured format within your church, within your body of Christ, that brings them in and confirms in them their adulthood. We do a number of things that just walks you through that, but I just want you to envision for just a moment with me a culmination of that in a church similar to this. Can you imagine for just a moment the entire church, husbands, wives, single moms, the pastors, other parents, the grandparents, all assembled together on one evening with the young people outside in the atrium and a process that would take place whereby they would come to the door there where their name would be announced and when their name was announced, their parents would come to a microphone and call out and say, for example, they use an example of T.J. Welch. In fact, T.J.'s pastors here today was one of the young men that came through the first rites of passage. And T.J.'s father stepped to the microphone and said, T.J., this is your father speaking. It's time for you to come out of the darkness and into the light. It's time for you to leave your childish ways behind and come into your godly manhood. And with that, with the church lining the aisles of the church, T.J., in fact, began walking down the aisle. And as he did, his church in its entirety began to bless him, speak into him, and affirm in him that they believed what was taking place and they were there for him in his young adult years. When TJ got to the front aisle there, he faced his pastor, or in larger churches, a member of the pastoral staff who asked TJ two questions based on what he had heard in some earlier sessions. It just said, TJ, do you understand godly manhood and are you willing to walk in it? When TJ affirmed that he was, his parents standing off to the side, his pastor directed him to go and present himself and kneel down in submission before his parents to receive their blessing and release into manhood. Boy, I gotta tell you, when a young man or a woman walks up to his parents and looks them in the eye and then kneels down before them, Submitting and honoring his parents, you can see the spirits of rebellion being broken. And then you can see it coming off the young people.
because for many of these families, the parents are watching their own children go to a place they've never been able to go to submit to authority and honor the authority in a biblical way. But when those parents pray that blessing over them, a meaningful touch, a spoken word, attach high value, foresee a significant future and a commitment to that future, prays for them and blesses them. In some churches, as high as 70% have had to have spiritual parents. We've already had Pastor Crisco talk to us about that because no child in the church is without a father or a mother who has sat there and stood in the gap and prayed over them. And then when they're all done, to see them step away and leave that son or daughter kneeling down. Why? Because they've been released, but to where? In the past, we've been releasing them to the gangs, to school initiations and all kinds of other things, but God's got a better plan and always has. Then a pastor steps over and prays a blessing and receives that young man or woman as a godly young man, not as a member. We're not trying to change the membership process, constitution, bylaws, or anything. It's not about that. It's about adulthood that God has done. And then taking that person by the hand, as was done with TJ by his own pastor, who's with you today here, and said, TJ is your pastor, I tell you now, to arise and join the men of this church, because on this night, you are one and raised him from his childhood to his adult manhood. And then turning, presenting him back to the parents, not as a young boy, but as a young man within the body of Christ. TJ, by the way, is interning as the youth pastor at that church now. It's kind of like telling Satan, go ahead. When you get them woven in like that, take your best shot. But when you bring those young men and women into the body of Christ, into your local church, as viable with their gifts, who they are, and what God has called them to, Satan will have a lot tougher time pulling them away. But right now, we're just making them sitting ducks because we're leaving them there in their childhood, and their adulthood is for somebody else to worry about because we haven't taken it on in God's way. God is calling for us to change that. We can raise an army. I've had enough experience raising armies. But at the same time that we're mobilizing and equipping and training the army of today, could I suggest to you that our efforts could be futile in many ways if we don't consider the recruitment process of raising that next generation of warriors that will come behind us. Let us not raise an army and forget to raise the legacy that will continue and sustain that army. Let us not be the generation of men who would be said of us that a great revival broke out but the next generation, our own children, neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for our great nation. Let's make a decision that as we raise an army, we are going to raise the next generation of warriors with it, not as children, but as young men and women, as God designed and created them to be, and ensure that it goes beyond our own legend to the legacy that God has planned. May God bless you and make you strong as you fight the battle. Thank you. The war that's on. I don't know if you know it, but there is a cultural war in our nation. It is so evident. And it's not politics. It's not politics. They've made it politics, but it is moral, immoral. And the church needs to arise and do what is right. It's not with placards. It's not even just casting a vote. And I believe in voting, yes. But it is absolutely through prayer. And we are raising an army of prayer warriors. That's been the heartbeat of Chuck Brewster. That we would raise a group of men that would pray with and for their pastors, for our nation. That we would see it happen, guys. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities of the air. And we must pray. Our next speaker is going to talk about a war, uh, this war as well. The war, again, is a, is a cultural war. You know, this nation is divided by race. It's divided by all kinds of religion, ideologies. But when I was in Washington, D.C. for Stand in the Gap, 
Coach Mack said one thing. He said, Jesus does not want sameness. He wants oneness. The body of Christ must come together. We must come together, folks. We don't go to the same church, and a lot of people criticize us. Why are there so many different denominations? You know what? Different things for different folks. That's why we have different churches, different denominations. But we've got to get back to prayer and be one. Amen. I respect our next speaker so much. He was born in Cuba, came to America when he was 13. God has his hand on this man. He serves on our advisory board for Honor Bound. I got to preach in his church. Man, it was alive. <laughs> it, I mean, you looked out over the congregation. It was moving, man. <laughs> it was great. They've got a, a great worship band, and you're going to love this guy. My brother, my dear brother, give it up for Glenn Wilson. Amen. Amen. Now go ahead and give the Lord a clap offering. Woo. Amen. You may have your seats. I tell you, I'm excited to be here. And uh, this indeed is a great time to, to be a part of Honor Bound. Honor Bound is, is doing some great things, but above all things, I, I, I am so excited to be a, a part of the passion. Thank God for Chuck. I, I tell you, I... Uh, God could not have blessed me more to allow me to work along with uh, our brother Chuck Brewster. He's, he's a man of passion. And, uh, I, I, you know, I don't like hanging around phony folks. I don't have time. You know, I'm, I'm getting too old now. You know, I got gray on my beard. I, I don't have time for phony stuff. And I just thank God for the passion that this man has. And Honor Bound, the vision of Honor Bound is, 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 is to take the gospel to the grassroots of America and the world. And I'm saying this because every one of you ought to be proud of what God is doing through Honor Bound. Amen. And you know what? Give this leadership a hand. Just, just give them a hand. Yes. As uh, Brother Jeff was saying, I, I was born in Cuba. I, I was not born in America. Came to America in 1971. I, I don't want to talk too much about Cuba because I'm going back there next month. And there might be some spies in here. But we have our problems there, and, and that's very notorious. You, you, you know history. When, when I came to America, I, I, I very quickly understood that, hey, there is a problem here. My, my, my first week in, in school was, was kind of strange. It, well, you know, it was strange anyway, coming from Cuba and two days later you were in America. Culturally, you, 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 you go through a cultural shock. But when I came to America, I finally realized that, that, hey, man, these folks got problems. I, I, 
I, I had never confronted racism. Let, let me explain something to you. I, I was shocked when my black brothers told me, you are not black. What, what a revelation, man. Tell me, you are Cuban. And I said, oh man, we, we got problems here. And what you, what you need to, 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 to understand is this. The same boat that brought your grandparents to America took my grandparents to Cuba. They, they all left Africa as slaves. The only difference is this. The slaves that were taken to the islands were treated as workers and they were respected. That's, that's, that's why a black man from, Afri from, from Africa and, and, a, and a black man from the islands can come to America and prosper. Because he has no hang-ups. The slaves that were brought to America, is, is everybody all right? The, the, the slaves that were brought to America, oh, by the way, I am a son of God. were not respected they were mistreated and, and, and that's why the black man of America is unlike any other black man in the entire world because he has hang-ups he was hurt now my first week in school in America man, man listen I, I got beat up Uh, for the simple fact that the guy that showed me around the school, he, he was a white guy named Harry Too. And then they, they didn't like the, the, the fact that I was hanging out with this white guy and, you know, I got jumped. Uh, you know, it wasn't bad because, you know, when I got up from the floor, you know, I ran home. <laughs> but, 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 but you know what? That's not the worst thing that happened to me. Let me tell you what the worst thing was, not so much that there was ra racism in America. I've been Pentecostal all my life, man, grew up in church all my life. E you know, I knew the Lord in Cuba, in, in my home. And the, the worst shocking thing, it was not that, uh, that, that, that racism was in America. That's not the worst thing. The worst thing that shocked me was that not only was racism in the world, but I, I, I found racism in the church. You can sit there with a straight face if you want to, but we, we are going to have to come to grips. And, and, and you might as well, you, 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 you listen, you, you might as well take it and swallow it. And understand that racism is in the church. Not, 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 not everybody has made the transition. Some folks on both sides of the fence were racist in the world. And, and, and after they, y'all all right? And, and, and after they got saved, they, they, they brought it in the church. Come on, come on, somebody. And somehow, instead of, of being uh, spiritual-minded folks, we still choose to hang on to our own cultures. Is everybody 
you follow me? And, and something has to happen. I, I, you know, I like what Brother Joseph Garlington said. The drought has ended. I'm telling you, the drought has ended. But we, we, we need to take that one step further. And, 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 and we need to take a conscious step. You, you see, all the hugging and all the kissing, you hug me and, and I kiss you. You know what I'm saying? That when, when we hit a high five, the problem is not here. The problem is when we go back home. Come on and say amen, somebody. Come on, y'all, y'all, listen. Some, some of y'all really scaring me. Y'all, y'all, I mean, you got that look. When we go back home, that's the problem. Now, now, now let, let me talk to you for a few minutes of, of a message that, that God has put in my heart. For how are we, how are we going to raise our cities? What, what is going to bring about a change? First of all, you need to, to, to understand this. You and I are not the final destination of God's blessings. Last night I prayed for a young man over here, man. I told you, he fired me up. I, you know, I knew I had the right word for today. When, when I prayed for that, he, he said, pray for me so that I'll be able to take home everything I receive in this conference. You, you, you see, what the church has been doing is this. We come to these conferences and, I mean, man, we get filled. We get filled, but the problem is that unless you take it home and allow it to go through you and bless somebody else, Come on, tell, tell, tell somebody, I, you are not the final destination. Come on, tell them. Of the blessings of God. Tell them again, tell them again, you. I, I, I mean, I, I hate to bust your bubble. What God is doing in you, it, it's supposed to flow through you. Oh, come on, come on. It's supposed to flow through us. God first does in us what he desires to do through us. Let me say it again. God first does in us the things he desires to do through us. He'll never be able to do for our cities what he has not done in the church. Now, come on, okay, let, 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 me, let me say it again. I tell you, some, some of y'all still got the scary look on your face. God will never be able to do in the city what he has not done. Now, now, here's what the church is doing. The church is praying, Lord, restore prayer in the school, Lord. And I mean, man, I mean, we, 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 we pray fervently. God, restore prayer in the school. And God says, okay, I can't restore prayer in school until I restore prayer in your home. It always, it, it, you know, it always amazes me. And, and you know what? It is hypocrisy. It amazes me that, that we want God to restore prayer in school. And most of us have never prayed with our children. You, you, you want your kids to pray in school, and when they come home, they don't pray. It's hypocrisy. 
Yeah, listen, you, you, you want to get prayer back in school? Get prayer in your home. Listen, hey, 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 hey. Teach your kids to pray. Once you teach your kids to pray, who is going to stop your son from walking down the hallway of the school? Somebody shout glory in here. Come on and shout glory. You see? I got news for you. I got news for you. Prayer is already in the school. God is raising up a generation of young people. And we are raising an army of men that are going to go back home and teach our sons to pray. You, you, you see, what, what you are talking about is just these little prayers, social clubs, prayer clubs. Where, 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 where we get together and pray and you cannot even mention the name of Jesus. That's foolishness. Teach your sons and your daughters to pray in the spirit. And as they're walking down the hallway of the school, man, no one can stop them from praying. God, oh Lord, Lord, there, there is so much racism in our city. Father, you got, listen, God says, okay, I, I know there's racism in the city, but the reason why there is racism in the city is because there is racism in the church. God says, you want to get rid of the racism in the city? Come here. Let me change you. Because I'll never be able to do in the city what I have not done in the church. Come on and say amen, somebody. As a matter of fact, if you want to test the temperature of the city, check the church. And I, listen, I, I know what I'm talking about. In these large cities where you got a lot of racism, can, can I talk to y'all? Y'all ain't going to jump me, huh? Where, 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 where Julio at? They, listen, hey, hey, hey. Dave Campolo said that the most divided hour in America is Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. When, when, when all the black folks go to their church and all the white folks go to their church, and, and, and in both pulpits, they're, they're talking about racism. Hey, why should there be racism? Look at the church. Pastor in Houston, Texas got up one, one Sunday morning and told the church, this year my, my vision is, is, is to go multicultural. He, he, he told the board, he said, this year, we are going into the project. This church has been established for over 20 years. And, and, and for 20 years, they, they have been bypassing the projects. I call it selective evangelism. Hey, hey listen, listen. Don't, don't kill yourself. You reap what you sow. If you've been sowing in the black community, you're going to get some black folks in your church. If you've been sowing in the white community, you will have some white folks in your church. Don't believe the lie. You know, the reason why we are, we, we are, we are, we are, we are all black in here, you know, no, 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 no. You're all black because you've only been sowing in the black community. Some, some of y'all don't like this word. I'm glad you, you don't pay my salary. <laughs> and, and Chuck done told me, as long as you're here, I'm, I'm feeding you. 
Somebody shout glory in here. God wants the works. Come on, come on, say it. Through me. Come on, say it. Through me. He wants to bless you, but whatever he does in you, it's not supposed to stop in you. When we come to these conferences, man, and we get all filled. And, and, and then we shout about what God is doing in my life. Can I tell you something? The greatest thing is not what God is doing in your life, but the greatest thing is what God is going to do through your life. Genesis chapter 12, God called Abraham. As a matter of fact, go, go, go there with me for a minute. I, I'm not going to be long. I'll have you out of here before 12 o'clock tonight, I promise. Gen Genesis 12. Let, let me just establish something. God wants to bless you. But whatever God wants to do in your life is not about you. Come on and say amen, somebody. Amen. Yeah, I mean, man, listen, God wants to bless you. He wants to pour it on you. But you have to learn to let it flow out of you in the same degree that it poured in. Yeah. Somebody follow me? Yeah. You, you, you know why some people have sporadic blessings? Because the last time you got blessed, you did not allow the blessing to go to the final destination. Is everybody follow me? As, as a matter of fact, that, that last financial blessing you got, it, 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 it wasn't all for you. You see? I don't care what color you are, we all get quiet when we talk about money. In Genesis chapter 12, God said, Abraham, come here. I'm going to bless you, Abraham. I'm going to, and, and Abraham, I'm going to make your name great. That is a progressive blessing. Leave your father's house. I'm going to bless you. And then God lays the whammy on him. I want to make you a blessing. Not only do I want to bless you, you, but I want to make you a blessing. And you know what, Abraham? Through you, I'm going to bless all the families of the earth. Here's what the church does. The, the, the minute we get to verse 2, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. We put a period right there and right about there, I mean, we, we go to shout. I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. But, but, but God said, be, be, before you start dancing, let me tell you the rest of the story. I'm going to bless you so that through you, I can bless the city. So, so, so everybody follow me? God's blessing upon Abraham was, was not just about Abraham. He wanted to bless the entire world through Abraham. Let me give you another principle. What he does through us is greater than what he does in us. Let, let, me, let me say that again. What God does through us is greater than what he does. Your pastor, I don't believe that. Well, let me show you. He blessed Abraham. But out of Abraham, he got a nation. And out of the nation, he got Jesus. I don't care what you say, Jesus is bigger than Abraham. 
on, come on, come on, come on. I say, I don't care what you say. What God got from Abraham is bigger than what he did in Abraham. Come on and say amen, somebody. Mary, Mary, uh, Luke chapter 1, the angel appears to Mary. Say, Mary, come here, girl. I got a plan for your life. Come on, y'all know the story. You are favored amongst all women. You see, right, right about there, Mary could start shouting, I'm pregnant, I'm pregnant, I'm pregnant, I'm pregnant, I'm pregnant. And God said, Mary, don't get excited. Because what I'm going to bring out of you is greater than what I'm doing in you. I don't care how pregnant she is. If, if, if she don't bring, in other words, if the blessing of God on Mary's life does not go through her, she could dance all she wanted. Y'all remember a couple years ago on one of those stories, all my children or something, Erica thought she was pregnant. Erica's walking around talking about she's pregnant. And I, you know, a lot of us are just like that. We, we, we spend hours talking about how blessed we are. I mean, man, I'm so sick. You know what? I don't have testimony service in my church. Because, I mean, I got sick of sitting back and hearing folks testify. And, and every testimony was about how blessed we are. The Lord just blessed. I, I got a brand new car. Big deal. I got, I, got a brand, I, got, I got sick of it. And I began to teach my folks, man, listen. When God bless you, you need to understand that it is supposed to flow through you. Did I establish that already? Can I move on? Yeah. Don't y'all rush me either. <laughs> Somebody shout glory in here. Glory. We need less, less talk about what he's doing in us and we need more talk about what he's doing through us. Now, now, let me get to my message. Oh, that was just an introduction. Turn to, turn, turn to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. Oh, glory. A lot of you don't even understand why God is blessing you. Come on and say amen, somebody. Yeah. You see, I believe that if God is going to bless our cities, some of us are going to have to be blessed within that city. Yeah. Come on and say amen, somebody. Yeah. You, I mean, listen, you, you, you can brag about how big your church is. And, and, and how big that building is that you're about to put up. As a matter of fact, we have gone so far that a lot of people equate God's favor by how big your building is. And, and, and you know what? We, we, we've been messed up by the prosperity teachers of America. I'm so glad for my upbringing. I was poor, man. I know what poverty is. I was so poor. I only spell poor with one O. I'm poor. <laughs> and, and 
listen, don't, don't, don't you know, I, I, I travel the whole world, just about the whole world. And I find more anointing and more Holy Ghost and more love in churches in South America under a tree than in churches in America. As, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, in, you know, in the entire global picture, the American church is a spoiled church. Don't tell me I pastor here. Folks, don't come to church if it's too cold. If you know, you know, if, if it's too hot, it's too hot. Most of our folks get these these, these twenty four hour viruses that only hits them on Sunday. And, and Sunday, Monday morning, the same folks that were sick on Sunday get up bright and early and go to work. You travel across the world, man, and people, it always amazes me. Because we bring our American attitude across the world. Talk about, we, we are coming to bless you, and most of the time, they bless us. I, I, I see people with that, that haven't eaten in three days. Barefooted folks. But you know what? They are so excited about Jesus, man. They, they don't care about no shoes, no food. They're excited about Christ. <laughs> what, what are you saying, Pastor? If God is going to take our cities to a new level, we are going to have to understand why he's blessing me. Let, let me just go to my text. Just for the first chapter, it's the turnover of power. Every, every, come on, every, everybody say the turnover of power. From Moses to Joshua. Now, let me just give you a little background. Moses pastored the Israelites in their infancy period the, the the israelites that 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 moses pastor were babies moses spent more time in you know in the nursery every time they got hungry they, they cried come on y'all y'all know the story you know you know are there any pastors here I never said I had a pastor. Man, the worst thing in the world is to pastor a bunch of babies. You know why? The minute you change one pamper, you, you, you got to change the other one. These folks were satisfied to wander in the wilderness. You know why? Because they had a welfare mentality. As long as the matter keeps falling, why should I go to the promised land? But, but now, when Joshua takes over, Joshua's no joke. The first thing Joshua tells him is this get your own food. They said, here, get your own food. Well, Joshua, what, what do you mean? No more manna? No more manna. They, they, they must have been shocked. But, but, but here's what I want to talk about, and then, then, then I'm going to shut up. Psych, psych. Joshua chapter 1. Verse 12. It says, And to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half a tribe of Manasseh, Joshua spoke, saying, 
Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, the Lord your God is giving you rest and is giving you this land, your wives and your little ones and your livestock shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side of the Jordan. But you shall pass before your brethren armed with your mighty men of valor and help them until the Lord has given your brethren rest as he gave you and they also have taken possession of the land which the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and enjoy it, which the Lord, which Moses, the Lord's servant, gave you on this side of the Jordan towards the sunrise. Look at me for a minute. These three tribes were a part of God's strategic method for establishing the Israelites in a promised land. Unlike the other, the other nine tribes, these three tribes were established, come on, say established, yeah. on this side of Jordan. They had land. Come on, somebody. They had cattle. I mean, they, I mean, God set them up on this side of Jordan. The purpose was, hey, listen, hey, Gad, Ephraim, or whoever it was, I, I'm, I'm just like Chuck. Listen, I'm setting you up, but I am not setting you up so you can sit back in your houses and brag about how blessed you are. Somebody shout glory in here. I'm setting you up so that when the nine tribes who have nothing, let, let me get nine guys over here. Hurry up, come on, nine, nine. Now, 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 I know this, this is Florida. Y'all have a problem counting, but, but, but come on, come on. Nine. Somebody shout glory in here. Glory. Now, 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 y'all get in a little circle. Let, 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 let me get three guys over here. These are the guys that were established. These guys were just like them at one time. They had nothing. They, they, they were wanderers. And God chose them out of them and brought them over here and established them and blessed them. Now, now here's the danger. The danger is that these guys forget where they came from. And now that I got my brand new Cadillac, and now that I got my brand, come on somebody, my home and my cattle, I forget about the purpose why God established me. So God says to them, listen, here's what I want you guys to do. You, 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 you guys got it going on, man. You got large churches and you got a lot of money. I bless you. Look, look at this place that I gave you. I didn't give you this place so you can brag about it and how big you are and how blessed you are. Because it is, if it comes down to it, it's nothing but the grace of God. So I bless you three tribes. Gad. Who else? Manasseh. And Reuben. I bless you three guys so that when your brothers come walking through about to cross over, I want you guys to leave your wives. He ain't talking about abandoning them. Well, what he's talking about is come out of your comfort 
and you are going to get in front of them. You guys, come on, come, come this way a little bit. Stop. Turn around. Canaan is that way. Somebody shout glory in here. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. When you see your brother begin to march towards Canaan land, don't forget they got nothing. I want you guys to get in front of them armed. Is, is, is that what the Bible says? And cross over in front of them and your job is to win the battle for them until they have exactly what you got. March, start going towards Canaan, nice and slow, nice and slow. Now you guys, you, 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 you got everything. Get in front of them. Somebody shout glory in here. Ho, 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 stop, 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 stop. You say, hey, wait, wait right here. Because we are gonna go ahead of you and we're gonna fight a battle for you. Come on and say amen, somebody. Because I cannot forget that I was once a dope addict and he saved me. I cannot forget that I was once an alcoholic and he saved me. Therefore, I owe it all to God. And now it's my turn to come back to the same community he saved me from. Watch this. You know why racism is so bad? Huh? Because after God blesses you, you can very easily go to the black church. He said, heck, f f forget them white folks. You, 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 you can very easily go to the white church and, and because you are so blessed now, you, 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 you don't want to have no little black children running around your church making your church look bad. You, you, you know we got all them Cadillacs out there. And the worst thing we want to have them, come on, y'all looking at me all kind of funny. <laughs> Say amen, somebody. Yeah. That is what the devil is trying to do. He's trying to get us to concentrate on color and forget the need. Beyond the color, there is a real need. Somebody shout glory in here. And the attitude is, man, whether you're black or white, I'm blessed. And the reason why I'm blessed is because God wants me to come back to you. I don't care where you live. And I'm going to fight your battle until you get exactly what I have. Come on, say amen, somebody. Amen. Don't forget where God brought you from. I don't care what color you are. If you're a dope addict, you're a dope addict. Am I talking right? Y'all, y'all sit down, sit down. Thank you, Jesus. God did not bless us so we could sit around in our great houses, in our great churches, and sing about how blessed we are. I want to impress you this afternoon. You have a responsibility. My brother, you have a responsibility of impacting our cities. God has placed everything in you that you need to take your city to a new level. You got it. I say you got it. Yeah. Now, 
I told you at the beginning, you are not the final destination of God's blessing. So your next responsibility is this. Take what God has given you to his final destination. Can, can, can I tell you something? Your church should look like the city you live in. Pastors all across America are calling Pastor Wilson, come and preach that message to my church. Come and tell my church that. Pastors are, are, are encountering resistance. And you know, I, 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 I understand. You can lose half of your church. But can I, can I, can I tell you something? The best thing could happen to your church is for those folks to leave. Yeah. When I started my, my church in this white community, I, I, I pastor a church in a white middle class community and, and I couldn't understand why, why you sent me here. I got so sick of people passing my church and thinking that's a black church. I mean, man, I just got sick of it. And I began to pray, God, send me some white folks. Anybody here Polish? I work with a lot of Polish people, man. I talk a little Polish too. Yakshimash and you don't know Polish? Man, put your hand down. Anybody here Polish? Where? You Polish? Where, where is he? Don't be afraid, brother. Yeah, yeah, ha, ha. Yeah, yeah, shabash. Hey, Charlie Polsky. You know, you know what that mean? <laughs> Sit down. Begin to pray, God, please. I would never be able to reach this community if you don't send some white folks to this church. I told God, I, I listen, God, I, I changed my worship. I, Lord, I promise you, I'll change the way we clap. I'll go from doing this, and Lord, we'll do this. Somebody shout glory in here. Glory. Well, well, if you're going to change, you're going to have to change some things. And God began to honor my requests. And the first one came. Man, we loved on that girl so much, she thought we were crazy. Every time she started around, she was, she was getting a kiss. And then the next one came. And then, and then God gave me a plan. Every Sunday after church, let the white folks stay in our front, our, our front of church. <laughs> let all the white folks hang around the front of the church. So 
the neighbors can pass and see, hey, they're not a black church anymore. That's a white church. Come on and say amen, somebody. What are you saying, pastor? What I'm telling you is that the kingdom of God is more than people that look like you. I need to remind you this afternoon that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That, 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 that he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. You, you want to hear more hypocrisy? I'm telling you, we got so much hypocrisy in the church, it's crazy. We, we, we raise all this money for, for our next year mission trip. Where are you going? We're going to Africa next year. What, 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 what you going to Africa for? You got Africa right in your neighborhood. We, 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 we fly way across the world and ignore the neighborhood right in back of your church. I come to the conclusion some of these folks just like to fly. Come on and say amen, somebody. Yeah. May I submit to you, leave Africa alone and let's begin to win New York, Cleveland, Mississippi. Win your own city. Yeah. Somebody shout glory in here. Glory. The Bible say, freely you have received. Freely give it. Come on and say amen, somebody. Amen. Take the gospel. Take it to the projects. Take it up to the mansion on the hill. Come on and say amen, somebody. Amen. I, I, you know, I'll tell you a story. I, you know, you know, I got carried away one time. Just got carried away. Started walking my city, and by, by mistake, I, I happened to walk into this white neighborhood. About five minutes later, the cop pulls up. He said, "Get in." He said, "So I said, where are we going?" He said, "People in the neighborhood got scared, and they called us." He, he said. I'm not arresting you. I just want to get you out of here because everybody's all scared. Now, can I, can, can, can I, can I tell you something? I, I understand that there is a stigma that's, that's been placed on American black men. You don't trust them and they don't trust you. I'm telling you, you are afraid of them and they're afraid of you. Well, can I tell you something? There, there, there's a place where all stigmas are broken. You know where it is? It's under the blood. I say it is under the blood. Can I tell you that, that the same blood that's able to wash you is able to wash them? Come on and say amen, somebody. And I also want to remind you that the blood has never lost its power. Come on and say amen, somebody. Listen, listen, I am challenging you. Take the gospel to every corner of America. I challenge you. Take your city for God. You say, where, where am I going to take him to your church? Sit him right next to that prejudiced one. Somebody shout glory in here. 
That's, that's why I like Honor Bound. That's why I like Chuck. I think I like Chuck more than Honor Bound. <laughs> I may not understand what Honor Bound is all about, but I understand what that man is all about. That man has a passion to win all men in America. And every time he talks to, to me, he wants to know, what do I have to do to get down, you know, into the neighborhood? I tell you what, I, you know, I like Chuck Stecker. That, that's the kind of guy I want to walk the alley with. He's tough. I wouldn't have to run with, if I'm with him. Get him, get him. What are you talking about? There is a passion. There's a passion. And can I tell you something? That's going to scare the devil. When we, when, when we all embrace one another. Oh, y'all don't hear y'all. You, you just don't even know. When we come to the place when man, I don't see what color you are. You don't see what color I am, but man, I see Christ in you. in you. I see Christ in you. You talking about restoration? restoration man there could be no restoration until we make up our minds that racism does not belong in the church yeah. let, let, let me talk let, 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 let me talk to my black brothers for a minute The drought is over. My, my, my brother, I, I, come here, bro. Let, let, let me touch you. you yeah, you, yeah. Okay, you and you. Yeah, come on up. There is a stigma. Come, 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 come on up. Come on up. I thank God for being born where I was born. God blessed me to be born in a country where there wasn't any racism. I came to America. My parents came to America. My father had $2 in his pocket. You know why we prospered? Because we did not have the stigma over us. There, 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 there's a lie that's been told to us, my brother, that the white man is keeping us down. The white man is not keeping you, you. You have to wonder why is it that the Africans and the Haitians and, and, and the one from the island can come to America and prosper. And the black men of America can't prosper. You know why? As long as you believe the lie, you won't be able to prosper. You follow what I'm saying? Don't believe the lie that God cursed Cain. Where well, we are, no, we ain't all curse. And if God cursed Cain, when you come to Christ, the curse is broken. Somebody shot glory in here. tell you something the Bible said behold if any man black man white man Chinese Filipino is in Christ he's a new creature don't 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 let our 
our leaders pour poison into your head. We cannot continue to listen to Farrakhan. Stop listening to him. That stuff is poison. All respect do you can't follow the Reverend Al Sharpton. You can't follow him. Pastor, what are you saying? I'm telling you, black man, you are free. Amen. You're free. That's the message. Chuck, I, you know, I, I met Chuck right outside these doors. He said to me, how can I tell him? How can I tell him this? How can I get down into the neighborhood? That's what it's going to take. That's what it's going to take. going to close how many y'all believe in this book right here yeah. you, you know what racism does it puts a wall you see if you don't like me because I'm black or white it does not allow me to get back to where I really was Hello, somebody. But if you take the wall out, then you'll be able to see that we are all brothers and sisters. Say amen, somebody. Because God only created one man and one woman. And out of that one man and that woman, we all came. Listen. Hear me. Hear me. We're going to have a prayer meeting here. And, and we're going to make the devil mad. Because there are fewer of us. Let me get all the brothers to come on up here. Wait, wait. See, 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 you, you guys missed it. When I said brothers, you, sh you, sh you should have all ran up here. Wait, 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 wait. Let, 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 let me have all the black brothers to come up here. I don't want anybody looking at their watch. We'll just come back at 6.30. You still gonna have enough time to eat. That's why guys, we like to eat. <laughs> but I wanna tell you right now, God's doing something right here through him. first board meeting I had, Glenn Wilson told me, he said, let me tell you right now, the Assembly of God is white. I said, I know. I had a meeting at Coach McCartney's office with 
Bishop Porter of Church of God in Christ. I've had some other meetings with Church of God in Christ officials. I said, how, how can we as men come together with Church of God in Christ and start healing a divide that happened over 85 years ago? That we are born in Pentecost and then separated because of race. How can we have an Assembly of God pastor and a Church of God in Christ pastor, because most of them are white, co-plant a church in the middle of a city and reset city for Christ? How can we take away the divides in our own fellowship or denomination? And what man put together for man's convenience, change it around for God's economy. Because God wants to heal that. We cannot grow something that's born in sin. I want every pastor in this place to come around these men. Glenn, I want you right down the middle of them. I'll wait. I want the pastors out of the out of the balcony. Surround them. Up. Yeah, come on around in front of them too. Come on around in front of them too. Jeff? Right here. That that thing. I don't want to divide you, but I want to be able to separate a row right in here. If you could just move this this whole group over a little bit. Just move over a little bit. I know this flower is in the way, but uh, Robert, if you can move this plant here. Just move on over to your right, son. I'm not dividing you. I just want to make it so the, so so we can get a visual effect here. That's good, right here, Jeff. Yeah. You see, we're not going to take our cities until we start taking our own hearts. We've been at Bless Me Club. We've been blessed to have a revival here at Brownsville in the Assemblies of God in the United States of America. But it's going to die like the fig tree of the Bible if we don't water that thing, if we don't bless it, if we don't start speaking to it, if we don't start reaching in the very community that we live in right here, if we don't start moving out in the name of Jesus, forgetting the color lines, forgetting the ethnos, forgetting all the things that divide us we are one holy nation under God if we've learned nothing else we need to learn that we're raising an army to move out under one commander-in-chief one commander-in-chief we don't have different types of armies fighting against one another we have one enemy the enemy is not man I want Glenn up here. Bring him up here, Jaron. Jaron, get down here. Bring him up. I want you, I'll get Gerald down there. I want people to pray for you, Gerald. Gerald goes to Assembly God Church right there in Mobile, Alabama. Be preaching there Sunday. Where's your son, Gerald? Is he down? Glenn, I want you to sit down in that chair right here. I want you to hold up. I want you to, I'm, you know, we're Pentecostal, amen? We do weird things. Washing somebody's feet is not weird. It's something Jesus would do. I haven't got the hair like Garlington talked about. I can't do it with my hair. 
God took my hair, I guess, or it fell out somewhere. But I want to tell you right now that I love this man. And I am an official of the Assemblies of God in my capacity as its national director. For every pastor that is standing before me that is white, I promise to you that I will provide resources to reach our cities. If you'll provide resources to get in our cities, You've got to open up the fountains of the pool of people and start talking from the pulpit to love your neighborhoods. It's not suburban church anymore. It's taking our cities. That is what we want to do on Raise This Army. It's all about, we hadn't got time to mess around doing church. God's coming soon. And if you can't see that, you better start getting on your face before God and start asking God to show you the way. Pastors, I love you. I love you. But we have to take a stand. We have to get on our knees. And we have to ask, Lord, I know this is symbolic, but Lord, my brother right here, I love him. I love him. And Father, I know it's just an act of bringing about a, a foot washing, but Father, it says more. It says that I'm washing away all that would divide us. Father, I am coming into the water with him, the water representing the Holy Spirit. We are one with you, O oh God. Father, we are gonna take our nation because we are raising up an army, O oh God, to fill, O oh God, every house of God with a balance of just looking just like the community it is. Father, it doesn't matter if they're homeless, it doesn't matter. Oh, it doesn't matter. But we have to be to each other what we want people to be to us. And oh God, as I clean his feet, as I set his feet apart and wash them and dry them, I ask you, oh Lord God, to fill my heart with the compassion of a servant who would wash someone else's feet, who would wash someone else's feet. In everything that I do, pastors, pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, peel away the layers of my heart. Let me feel the way you feel. Let me see with your holy eyes. Let me hear with your holy hands. Oh God, restore relationships with mankind. It's not reconciliation. It's restoration. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Right now, pastors, I want you to hug on your brothers. I want you to pray for them, and I want you to ask, ask symbolically forgiveness for the offenses. You know, Glenn made a very profound point. It's unique in America, but it ha doesn't have to be. It can change, and the change comes with us. The change comes with us. A change comes with us. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Holy Ghost. Jesus. Come in, coach. I want you to know right now, gentlemen, that we're going to take a break. Uh, it's 4.30. I, I, I don't want to leave this moment. I want you to talk. You see, it's a shame that we would have this conference and only have three or four dozen 
of our brothers, because I know there's more than that in the house of God. This is something that's dear and dear to my heart, and I'll share more about it Wednesday. I keep talking about my, my, my service Wednesday. I want to tell you right now, I've got about nine hours of preaching to do Wednesday and an hour to do it. Coach McCartney is here. You want to greet the men before we leave? Because I know this is near and dear to his heart as well. I wish that I uh, could be here for the whole conference. And as soon as we landed, I got here and I got to hear uh, Chuck Stecker. And, and uh, that was, I didn't even hear it all, but I was impacted. And then I heard all of uh, Pastor Glenn Wilson, and um, it, it occurs to me that um, with the discrepancy of the number of men of color that are here, that um, for this man to come here and bring that message is it's, uh, it's as good a message as I've ever heard on what has to happen, and it has to happen now. And, and, I, I just would believe that a year from now when this gathering took place, it would look a lot different. It would look a lot different because uh, the blessing would be given away and it would manifest itself in a completely different representation and it would be because of the efforts of those who have been blessed that would uh, God would do such a work that it would just demonstrate itself and I don't say all that to put a guilt trip on anyone I just believe we've heard a fresh word from God the drought is over and it's a new day yes. and, and God and I, I just want to say one more thing I, I didn't know I would get this opportunity now but I just um, sat and listened to Josh McDowell preach for uh, 60 minutes he came to promise keepers and he talked about the age group of 9 to 17 he talked about the fact that uh, seven million of them are in the church right now and they're lost. And he talked about the fact that in uh, 10 years, there will be no 20 year olds in the church and there will be no 21 year olds in the church and there will be no 22 year olds in the church. He said, except that there's one group of men in the church that are doing something. And as God is my witness, he said, it's the assemblies of God. Uh, leadership they are doing something and so um, I mean, he had no reason to say that in in our setting because he wasn't you know uh, trying to please anyone he was just testifying that the assemblies of god have the kind of leadership and they have the kind of direction that gives real hope to what God is doing out there. And so it's, you know, I, I come here out of uh, humility and respect. I, I'm anxious to be here. And, but I do want to say that the first thing that I saw when I walked in is I looked at the audience and, and I, it, it, it grieved me. It grieved me. I'm just telling you, point blank. I said to Jarrell Gilliam, did they charge the brothers double? Uh, because this is not what it's supposed to look like. This is not, this is not what's on God's heart. And, and so for Pastor Glenn Wilson to come and bring such a powerful and, and truthful, riveting message, uh, you know, I just honor him and honor these men that are here, the men of color. Thank you, pastors. I look forward to sharing with you tonight what I believe we can do about it. Thank you. Amen.